it is, then it's mine. If it's not, then I'm not so sure. It's mine. And uh, so that's sort of a model that that you you hold up. A yeah, model is not is the word I'd want to avoid because that makes him sound like an exemplar. I mean, be like this and you'll be all right. I, uh, he just uh, be. Uh, Christ in his fullness as he appears in the New Testament, as he appears in the church, as he appears in people who've loved him and served him, um, is the, the test, let's put it that way, better than model. The test of truth. If it's his, I think of it as true with a capital T. If it's not his, who knows? But I, I would mm. be I would look at it in another another way. Can you think of any instances when you've used that as a... As well, a yes, I can. I, for instance, Buddhism, uh, when I was teaching at Exeter, I, uh, there was a great cry in those days, if you're going to teach Christianity, you should teach all religions, which sounds very liberal and a good, good idea. If you happen to know, I didn't know all religions. And you say, but I did come to know a lot about Buddhism, and I did teach that in addition to Christianity, side by side with it, because it makes a wonderful uh, play, because in some ways they're very much alike, some ways uh, not alike. And the, the sort of watershed, one of them, in terms of differences between Christian truth, Christ truth, and Buddha truth, I think, is in the area of love, where Buddha says, he who loves 50 has 50 woes, he who loves 20 has 20 woes, he who loves 10 has 10 woes, he who loves none has no woes. And everybody knows what he means, and he's right. I mean, as soon as you love a child or a wife or whoever, a husband, uh, you are vulnerable not only when bad things happen to you, but when bad things happen to them. Therefore, if you're follow the Buddha's advice. In that case, you simply don't love in that sense. You don't get involved in another person's life to the point where it lets suffering into your life. And yet here is Jesus uh, saying, love your neighbor as yourself, saying that when you love in the sense of suffering for another, you are drawing close to the very heart of the mystery of God himself, because that is, that is God love, God suffering for man as he loves him and seeks to draw him back to himself. And you simply you have to choose and drawn as I am to, to Buddha, in that place I have to say I know exactly what you mean and you're right as far as you go, but, but the truth for me is finally Christ's truth, that yes, uh, to love is to suffer, that's what the cross is all about, but it's, what's, it's also what Christ is all about, and therefore it is, it is the truth, mm. if that makes any sense to yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering if there are um, some examples of things um, just in your uh, your daily living, where that kind of test is held up. Ah, uh, yes. Well, yes, I'm sure there are lots. Um, well, the whole idea, for instance, that people have that if something bad happens to you, um, it's because God is punishing you, let's say, or if there's a witless accident and the child is killed, well, God came time for God to take him. That kind of idea of either a, a a punitive God who gets at you by having you get AIDS, for instance, or a, uh, a uh, God who disregards all the reasons why a family wants to keep a child alive and simply takes him because his time has come. That simply is not consistent, in my mind at least, with a picture of a merciful and uh, loving and in a way imaginative God that you get in Jesus. So I have to reject that. I say, no, I don't think it was God's will. I don't think this is God punishing people at all. That doesn't sound like the mm. God I've found in What do you mean Christ. imaginative God? That's, a, that's an interesting way of uh, phrasing it. Yeah, I never used that phrase before. Um, um, imagine the sense that uh, you can't outguess him. You never know what's going to happen next. I mean, who would ever have guessed, for instance, in the parable of the prodigal son, that when the prodigal son came back, having made an utter fool of himself, spent everything he had, that the father would say, before the son even had a chance to choke out his apology, Father, forgive me, or you know, whatever, it, he plans that little speech, and the, the old man just runs down and embraces him before he has a chance to say a word, and doesn't say, look, yes, of course I let you home at first, you've got to apologize to your mother, you've got to promise me, it says none of those things, just welcomes him back. Uh, imagine him in the profoundest sense, nobody could have seen that coming. That, uh, and it is, it is, that is more than almost any other story, I think, would be evidence to me of the, of the, of the very profound and, and enchanted imagination of Jesus. And that's true in lots of the parables, I think. I'd like to talk a minute about sin. What is, what is sin for you? Well, my old teacher, Paul Tillich, not a friend, I didn't know him, I was in awe of him, but I sat listening to him a long time. And I, to me, the most useful definition really was his, uh, where he speaks of sin as that which 
increases separation was his word, you remember? Uh, separation from yourself, self-doubt, self-hate, confusion, uh, unsureness of identity. Uh, sin is that which separates from other people, mistrust and dislike and indifference. Sin which separates you from God in whatever way you want to understand that, or whatever you do that uh, makes you either forget about God or, or reject him or hate him because he demands things that you cannot do. In other words, the direction away from the sort of centrifugal force of life mm -hmm. is what sin means to me. And it's sin is something both one does and it is done to you. You get caught up in a world where so many of the things that happen to you, let alone what happened inside of you, are driving you in that direction. Again, New York is a good example. I mean, New York scares the daylights out of people because it's a scary place. And uh, I find myself avoiding catching certain eyes as I walk down the street, you know, that kind of thing. That is because the word sin describes that dimension of life in a big mm. city. Does salvation have any relevance to you in terms of... Oh, well, yes, I think so. I mean, uh, it would be... I mean, if, if sin is the centrifugal, sort of that which uh, draws us, pushes us farther and farther away from each other and from God and from our true best nature, then uh, salvation will be just the reverse, the sort of, what is it, centripetal? Mm -hmm. uh, where Tillich used the words reunion, reconciliation, and resurrection, where at moments of grace, like with the black lady, uh, all of a sudden, for an instant, I was not only reunited and reconciled to this stranger, but out of it came, not for all that long, and yet you see it, so I'm still talking about it two years later, a kind of new life. Uh, and this does happen. This certainly does happen. And I think that's a lot. I mean, salvation to me would mean that kind of healing, that kind of making whole, that kind of uh, eradication of the usual barriers that exist between people who are such strangers to each other. Mm. And um, then the kind of new life that emerges out of that. Mm -hmm. When you're thinking about salvation, um, what do you think it's? What do you think we need to be saved from? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people. Uh, that's a very real question. Saved from what? And I think they're up to think of it in some very narrow, so in quotation marks, religious sense, which means nothing to them. But I think if you say salvation is to be saved from yourself, to be saved from all that which makes you feel unhappy and uh, fragmented and alone. Then they prick up their ears. Mm -hmm. I mean, Jesus saying, you know, the wonderful words, come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's talking there about what you want to be saved from, from the weariness and the heavy ladenness, which everybody who's human recognizes as part of the shadow part of what it is to be alive, to be saved from that. 